Hello, welcome. I'm Dr. Jill Brooks, Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. So glad you can join us today for our webinar, HIPAA for the Front Office Team, presented by Rhonda Granja. I know that many of you have already attended Rhonda's lectures through the Practice Management Institute and are familiar with her wealth of experience and her passion for speaking tends to get ex attendees excited about what they do. In addition to teaching classes and presenting at conferences, she works as an independent medical consultant and has been in the medical office profession since 1990. Her vast experience has been achieved by actively working in all areas of a medical practice, everything from the front desk to the clinical side. Rhonda is an active member of the American Academy of Professional Coders, Medical Group Management Association, and the Consumer Family Advisory Committee. She has extensive knowledge of billing and reimbursement related to managed care and commercial carriers, as well as Medicare and state-funded projects. Aside from her professional relationships, she makes time to advocate with the nonprofit organization Autism Speaks. You will find her handout for this webinar on the control panel for you to view during the webinar and also to save for your later use. We will also send out a video link and the handout separately in an email. Rhonda? So, HIPAA, um, obviously a good question to ask your front desk team or your front desk team members if they know what the acronym stands for. I can't tell you how many uh, practices and facilities I've gone into and I ask them to pull out their wonderful HIPAA manual and they have it spelled H-I-P-P-A, which it's not hippopotamus, uh, even though we may like for it to be. But it certainly stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and you know it was created back in the 90s. Uh, nothing to say about that. There's no test at the end of this, so no worries as far as that goes. But in all essence and all sincerity, the government is trying to make our lives simpler. <laughs> So that's why we have what we call HIPAA administrative simplifications. Uh, so we'll certainly talk about those again. And that might sound a little far-fetched, but um, just a couple of things to point out. HIPAA was created certainly to protect, and we have to safeguard. So we'll certainly kind of stress that throughout this little slideshow today. The intent of HIPAA was created for three reasons. One, to provide some insurance portability for our patients. Because, as you know, communicating with Cigna, the Blues, Medicare, Medicaid, United, Aetna, whoever, there's so many policy procedures. And now, of course, I'm learning. I have sign-in, sign-outs, passwords, all this good kind of stuff. Why can't we just have something that's uniform and consistent? Hopefully, we'll get there one day. That would probably be the goal. But obviously, they wanted to, and when I say they, I'm speaking of the government in this sense, uh, they wanted to come along and promote simplification and have some consistency in the industry. And obviously, we hear a lot about fraud and abuse. So certainly, we'll kind of stress some of that today as well. But the law includes some provisions. One is that it was designed to encourage some of the electronic means that we have and obviously not some of the issues that I've experienced <laughs> with this. And certainly, to have those safeguards and protect the confidentiality of our patients. Uh, with some identifiers and all that good kind of thing. I always found it very interesting that Farrah Fawcett was such an advocate um, and how the hospital, being UCLA out in California, you know, released her information to the media and certainly let all the tabloids and all those folks know, Entertainment Tonight, whatever, that she had cancer even before her family. So uh, she was actually a very good advocate. But patients have many, many rights under HIPAA. Some of those have certainly changed. Uh, HIPAA has now evolved. I used to tell folks if you got bit by HIPAA, it used to leave a little mark. Now if you get bit by HIPAA, it actually takes uh, you know, some of that tendon and you'll probably have to have surgery and everything else. The fines, penalties, and all of that has certainly increased. But there's many, many expanded rights that so we need to maybe focus or mention some of those today as well. But under the new regulations, what we have to do under HIPAA is to certainly evaluate what your current practice policies are, your protocols, your procedures, everything. And I always tell my office managers, kind of stand back in your office, maybe where a patient would stand, look to see what vulnerabilities you may have if you're able to overhear things, being at the triage station or the nursing station or you know, some of our new architectural buildings, the walls are very thin. Um, so we'll certainly talk about maybe what constitutes the breach. What do I have to do? Another good thing just to make sure you do is called a gap analysis. 
And that's where, again, you kind of want to stand in the place of where your patient would stand. Look at what your protocols are in your practice and see that you are keeping things as secure as you possibly can, especially when it comes to electronic medical records and even some of you may still have paper charting. And that seems to be the intent now is that we're switching over from paper to electronic. Some of you may say, uh, well, no, I actually have both of those. The HIPAA was, of course, what the PHI stands for is Protected Health Information. That's basically anything in the medical record, um, anything that can be construed to identify a person. So we also have another acronym, which is IIHI, and that stands for Individually Identifiable Health Information. There are 19 of those, so we're going to talk about those today as well and at least mention them. And then a funny question I like to always ask, and again, you can kind of think about this for a second, if you're talking about a date of birth for a patient, is that considered protected health information or is that considered identifiable individual health information? So I'll let you ponder that one for a second. But under HIPAA, we have what we call authorization use. And that is, again, maybe something that's not intended for the treatment or not in the treatment payment or healthcare operations for a valid patient um, what you have to have is an authorization. In other words, I got to know that it's okay for me to treat that patient because without that, my physicians and my clinicians, if you will, could be charged with um, something like abuse. You don't want that, assault and battery type of thing. That's awful to have a physician that has to undergo that only because they didn't have the proper authorizations in place. So be careful. And it says you cannot obviously require a signed authorization in order to provoke treatment. So I can't state to the patient, well, if you don't sign this, I can't see you, I can't treat you, that type of thing. But there's reasons and protocol. And again, you just want to make sure that you are following the letter of the law. And then the patient or that responsible party can certainly revoke and take back that authorization at any time that they need to. Some of the most common privacy violations that we have um, and you think of these in just your everyday uh, functionality, one is overheard conversation. So, and here we're using the term receptionist. I don't really like to use that. I like to call those front desk team members front desk specialists because you know they have to be very special to sit in that seat. Uh, but those folks uh, can sometimes have certainly many conversations with patients in your office whether you're trying to schedule them or make a referral for them, have them see another specialist or another entity of medicine, uh, such as an oncologist. Obviously, just common sense. If I'm standing back and I hear my front desk member scheduling an appointment for my patient and people in the lobby are saying to me, hmm, what could that be an indicator of in that, oh, that patient must have cancer? You know, then you kind of think outside of the box with that and presume and assume, which is never good. But somebody that certainly leaves their desk with their computer screen up and visible, that is just a common thing that happens all the time, those little sticky notes flying around. And then protected health information or that identifiable information actually left on your desk or discarded in the trash where your cleaning crew or your janitorial staff can actually look at it, take a peek at it. Those are common things that we do in our day-to-day, -day, but yet it can have some serious consequences if you think about it. Some other ones, sign-in sheets, and I like sign-in sheets. Those are okay. Just be really careful with how you have those. Uh, a good idea is to have the ones that have the sticker that you can actually pull back um, the sticker and that way that nobody's going to be exposed to that patient's name and potential information about them. Be careful with phone messages and how you leave messages with voicemail these days. Everybody has smartphones and such, and even potentially a transcriptionist that's actually playing some things back. Maybe she's typing stuff, um, a note or a, partic a particular surgical record that the doctor has transcribed, and she turns that speaker up because she couldn't actually make out what he was saying. So at the check-in area, there's a couple of things that I suggest. First of all, I want you to avoid using things like you don't want to ask these two questions. Oh, these irk me to pieces. Asking a patient if their insurance is still the same or if anything has changed. Of course, if somebody asks me, is your insurance still the same, then yes, it is. <laughs> Why would you need to know that I now have Blue Cross? Oh, I've changed insurance two or three times since then. 
change jobs and whatever, of course you don't want to ask that. You want to dig a little deeper. And then if you ask, has anything changed? Of course I'm going to say, oh, no, everything's good. We're cool. And then you want to use something like, please give me the name of your insurance. Again, you're just re-verifying, reconfirming. You can even say to the patient, I need to verify that we have your most current information. I need to take a peek at the ID number. You know what, Mrs. Jones, I'm a little bit dyslexic. So if you let me take a peek at that, that'll be great. And again, you kind of put the default or put the blame back on yourself so that the patient doesn't feel inconvenienced in any way, shape, form, fashion. And then, of course, always, always adequately respond to your patients. If they say things like, it's the same as last time, then again, you just reiterate, Ms. Jones, just for verification purposes, and again, we're trying to safeguard your information. We're trying to protect your identity. So honestly, we're required to double check the name of your insurance company. I'm sorry if that's going to cause you some inconvenience, but if you don't mind working with me, I promise I'm just trying to protect you. So if they feel that it's a personal connection, they'll be more apt to give you that. So please know what forms you're actually needing that patient to fill out and sign. You don't want to use things like asking the patient, what's this for? You know, the patient could, can certainly come and say, well, that's the HIPAA form. Then the patient, well, what's that? You don't want to say, well, it's the privacy form. And they're going to be like, well, what's that? So again, you know, and they can respond and say to you, their response may be, well, you know what, I already signed that. You mean I have to sign it again? You don't want to say that. You don't want to reiterate that. You can use something that's a little bit more professional and state to them, there are things called HIPAA regulations. And then you explain to the patient, actually I'm required to provide you that updated notice of privacy policy and practice protocol so that, again, allow me to show you some things that might have changed here. Actually, I have to safeguard your information as best I can. So make sure you know your state and federal regs. I know Texas has certainly got a little bit different stuff. You know, House Bill 300 and such, they're really up to par um, with some of these policies and procedures and some of the HIPAA rules and regs. North Carolina is a little more lax than that, so it just depends on where you are geographically. But note that compliance is never, never an option. You want to make sure that you're providing your patients the notice of privacy practices. Again, that policy, you make a good faith effort. Uh, the government says that that's exactly what we need to do to provide that to the patient and get written acknowledgement of that receipt of the notice of privacy and how that information will and can be used about them. So, and the scenario is that an established patient signs in for their appointment and they actually instruct the front desk that they do not want their insurance billed and they want to pay out of the pocket. Well, you could say something like today's charges are going to be or today's total is going to be. Give that to the information. What happens if you say we have a contractual agreement with your insurance to bill for services rendered, which not that long ago that would actually have been my response but that has changed. We now have something called omnibus rules, uh, which patients have more rights. I kind of said that a few minutes ago. Those rights have been expanded uh, quite a bit. So I've given everyone, or um, hopefully we've included that. Jill was kind enough to help me do that. There is an opt-out form that I shared with everyone. So if you wanted to uh, certainly use that, plagiarize that, put that on your letterhead, what have you, and it obviously gives the patient the right to opt out of their insurance for the day. But what you've got to remember is that some of these EMR, EHR systems don't give you a whole lot of capability with doing some of that stuff. Because what happens if you get a blanket request from an insurance payer that says, okay, on Mary Jones, I want records from this date to this date. If my patient has opted out of their insurance for a particular date of service, I cannot release that opt-out note for that day's service. In other words, she said to me, I don't want this shared with anybody. No how, no way, no shape, no form, no fashion. So that means it's up to me as the provider to safeguard that information to the best of my ability. And actually, I had a patient, and I tell folks this is a great example of this. 
I had a particular patient that being in obstetrics and gynecological medicine that she was not faithful to her husband. So being that her husband was the subscriber, she did not want her insurance information shared. And so the problem and the challenge for me became, oh my gosh, how do I safeguard that? Because sometimes my medical record folks and the folks that do that functionality might be not so up to par on it. They may not know that she opted out of insurance for that date service. So I had to figure out how to weigh, uh, how to get that information safe and secure. So I ended up giving her a separate dummy medical record number, which sounds a little bit extreme, but that was the only way that I could do that. Because with not, you would actually be violating some of the new HIPAA requirements. So be really careful that the patients now have the right to pay cash if they so choose. Um, now that's not going to be applicable to a state product or certainly Medicare or a federal product. I'm talking about your HMOs, your PPOs, your points of service plans, those indemnity plans, all that good kind of thing. Because we know that the federal government, state federal government, is a little bit different animal. So there you want to make sure that you're providing forms for patients to sign. Don't say sign here, 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 here. Really? You want to say, please take a look. Please take a moment to review and sign something like our financial policy so that, again, patients aren't um, maybe surprised at the whole end of that. Now, classifying business associates, that's another one that has been updated. Um, even though HIPAA doesn't really even, uh, they don't really talk a whole lot about it. But it's funny how they don't mention your uh, janitorial folks and the people that clean your practices and your facilities as listed as a business associate. Uh, they list them as a totally different but I would, I would still get them to sign a business associate agreement only because, again, the rights have been expanded. Those things have changed up considerably since HIPAA took place in 1996. So we certainly want to make sure that we're following the letter of the law. And again, they're going to be exposed. It doesn't matter. If they clean your office and you lock everything up, there's going to come a time that I promise you somebody's going to see something, hear something, come across something, turn a piece of paper over, doesn't matter. So just safeguard, get them to sign a BAA just in case. So a few examples of some of the ones that I've given you is certainly going to be like your billing service folks, collection agencies, anybody that deals with your computer like my wonderful IT guy, consultants, and again, there I have asked the question, what about janitorial people? And then the identifiers uh, for individual information. As I mentioned, there are 19 of them. Some of the ones that you don't really think about would be things like vehicle identifiers. I always found that one an interesting one, only because now in some of the states, uh, you can get personalized a license plates for your cars. Uh, and again, that is an identifier of that individual. Uh, like in the case of my car in North Carolina, my license plate, I drive a Honda Fit. It says Mom's Fit. Uh, that license plate is registered to me. Um, so, so, you know, people look at my husband funny when he drives my car. Uh, maybe it should say dad's fit on there. I'm not sure. But so the security numbers are certainly evident. Our names, account numbers, full face photographic images, uh, any of those. Email addresses can certainly identify someone as well as the social security number. That's pretty, pretty you know, again, common sense stuff. Uh, but patients do have the right to look at their information. They can come in and say, I want to know who you've sent my information to, for what purpose, what did you send, when did you send it, who did you send it to. Make sure that you're able to account for all of that. And also make sure that you are providing those wonderful NPPs, being the notice of privacy practices to all of your patients. Most patients will just throw it on the chair, on the table, you'll see it in the trash but very important information on there, and it outlines certainly how information is going to be used about them. Now, with that said, patients have many rights, so you want to make sure that you attempt to get that acknowledgement every time, uh, and again, that you explain that the patient has the right to review information about them, and if there are mistakes or things that need to be rectified in the record, then again, you get someone to sit down with them and certainly take a peek at that. Because if a correction is going to be denied, then the patient has the right to request that statement of disagreement. And that actually has to be included in your permanent record. Obviously, you have the right to file a rebuttal if you disagree. And then, of course, you want to explain to patients 
that there is a right to limit or restrict disclosures and same thing on the accounting side piece. Now be careful about identity theft. Um, the government was strong to say and strong to issue some words of advice uh, earlier in the year. Uh, they've kind of retracted some of it because the Federal Trade Commission wanted to do this and that and the other and you know again lots of stuff. So be careful with the terminology of red flag but it can mean Again, just something that alerts your front desk team. If somebody comes in and they have gotten a funky address and they can't confirm what their old address is, or you know the picture looks a little jaded and doesn't really look like them, or they can't recall certain things, then again, you might just alert your practice manager or somebody and say, mm, something's not quite right here. So in the clinical setting, there are some red flags as far as that, as far as medical conditions. Certainly our nursing staff could account for that. And then even records being inconsistent uh, with that particular history of the patient. And maybe there are some other discrepancies like the age of the patient, some other physical descriptions in them. Um, and now certainly, you know, women change our hair color and we do all kinds of stuff. But just being kind of proactive and paying attention, paying attention to our patients is very important. Some other ones uh, to mention, or I think worth mentioning, is going to be social networking, social media. In fact, I read an article early this morning when I got into my office here, um, into the office that I'm now helping. Um, there was an article that came out, and it's titled, and I can send this to you later if you would like, but it's um, actually put out from a group called uh, Practice Your Way. And it says, think your practice is HIPAA compliant, then you might want to think again. And what it's talking about, it's an interesting article. You could probably Google it, too. It's talking about how doctors are using texting as a means of communicating now. Um, and that's a great, easy way with smartphones and such. But we got to be careful. And things like Facebook and Twitter and, you know, there's so many of them now. I'm learning with my 11-year-old child. Um, oh, there, Snapchat is one. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there. So you might want to certainly adopt, maybe revamp your policy procedure on your patients having smartphones in your office uh, because you just don't realize what a huge liability it might be because you have to safeguard protected health information regardless of the setting. And then you don't want to post any information about patients, uh, pictures and that type of thing. Be careful about them. Um, just really, really watch out. I've seen a lot of offices like in pediatrics, oral maxofacial surgery is one, obstetrics and gynecology is another, where we have these wall to fames and bulletin boards with our pictures of our patients on there that we're so proud of maybe these babies that we delivered. Um, I've even seen one in ophthalmology where patients have had before glasses, after glasses, or after eye corrective surgery. So if you haven't gotten a special consent from that patient allowing you to post their picture for the world to see, because you have drug vendors, you have reps, you have IT people, you have phone people, you have copy people come in, you have all kinds of people coming in and out of your facility. I know that. So believe me, even if a patient sent you the picture, like at Christmas time, make sure you have a consent that they know and they're aware that their picture is going to be posted for everybody to take a peek at. So I wanted you to have the terms of routine versus non-routine disclosure in there. You can kind of see for routine or recurring request. Covered entities being you, you are the covered entity. You've got to implement some reasonable uh, policies and procedures for which, again, things that could be pretty much standard if you're limiting information. Um, again, for us doing referral type basis. For non-routine disclosures and requests, again, you've got to develop reasonable criteria, set some limits on those disclosures. You don't want to release everything for sure. Um, you don't want to release, you know, too much information. And I have practices that do that. For example, if a patient comes in and she's an OB patient now and she's pregnant now, really, should I probably be releasing things that happened with um, maybe two normal deliveries or two normal pregnancies that she encountered two years ago or surgery or a procedure that was happened back in the past? 
Maybe not, if it doesn't have to do with what's being treated present day. So be really careful about that. Now your MPP and what we call the Notice of Privacy, here it's just given it's the rules and regs for you that the requirement for mandatory written content has certainly been revised. You're still required to provide that to your patients. Um, you can certainly come up with a policy that enables and requires consent, but you're only required to make a good faith effort to get that patient to sign it because the patient may refuse to sign. And then, of course, you attest on there that they did refuse to sign. Your uh, responsibility, again, that protocol, it's got to be posted in your office. If you have a website, it has also got to be on the website. And then you must provide a copy to every single patient. Um, the notice should be provided prior to you starting treatment. Uh, obviously, payment and healthcare operations, that's where we file the claims and such. And get, unless there's some type of um, funky in, you know, circumstance or extenuating circumstance that, uh, such as an emergency, that the patient could not sign it at the time until, of course, things were back to a normal rate. Um, even though the patient's signature is not required, certainly the OIG prefers that we get that. Normally, notice is only going to be required if you have what we call a DTR for direct treatment relationship. Um, for all other non-treatment and things of that sort, authorization is going to be required under that standard. So again, if the doctor doesn't get it, you know, it's not going to be a violation as long as you had a good faith effort. Document, 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 document. That there was a good faith attempt provided there. So doctors should be documenting. Uh, all attempts at that. And who can give notice? Well, that's going to be obviously our patient if, in fact, they are competent. Um, or even an emancipated minor, that's where the law comes in. You find out what states uh, consider emancipation. So, for example, Alabama is certainly different from North Carolina in that regard. Um, so make sure that, that you find out what the legal age of that is. Or an executor of an estate, somebody that's obviously been appointed by the court, um, I find more HIPAA violations, and this is very interesting, I find more HIPAA violations actually occur uh, for patients that are deceased uh, because siblings and, uh, you know, brothers and sisters are arguing over different things and property and such. Um, so you'd be surprised how many HIPAA violations actually occur after the patient's no longer here. So in the case of an incompetent or critically ill patient, uh, again, you want to provide consent. There are some legal representatives that are able to sign for them, that would be a guardian. Uh, maybe somebody with power of attorney or somebody that's named in a directive or the next of kin being spouse, adult child, mom, dad, brother, sister, something of that sort. So this is where state laws are going to come into account. So as I mentioned earlier, um, certainly you've got to look and make sure that your state law and what that is, uh, be careful about grandmas taking little kids in to see a pediatric doctor. Maybe mom did not want the child to go into the physician's office that day, but grandma said, no, they're sick and they're going to go anyway. So just watch out for that. You don't want to get in the middle of a family dispute either. Uh, but parents that agree to allow a confidential relationship, uh, and this is talking about the doctor and a minor child, Again, they will be excluded from receiving information, so make sure that those parents and those folks understand that, especially if there could be a harmful repercussion to that minor child. So patient confidentiality, again, just basic common sense stuff. Patients have the right to have confidential care provided to them. Uh, you know, it's amazing. Folks don't want information posted to the world. so. Our job, our responsibility is to make sure that that's very sensitive information, even our staff. I also find violations happening within staff groups. Uh, nurses working very closely together, nurse gets home, starts telling husband or other significant other all about the nurse that she worked with that day. Really? That's, you know, again, I, I get that you want to talk to your family, but just be careful about what you talk about. So all information being medical, social, whether it's written, spoken, what have you, electronics are certainly the world in which we live in today, things have got to be held in strict, strict confidence. Um, so again, just make sure you find out what the reason or what the situation is for you to release information. Uh, make sure if you don't need to know it, if it's not going to impact your job, 
then you've got to stand back and say, hey, wait a minute. Um, that's when you start, again, your ears go up and that type of deal. So patient confidentiality certainly begins from the very first moment you receive information about them. And again, that information can come from a different, different means. It could come from the patient. It could come from a family member. It could come from your doctor. It could come from any other healthcare professional. But again, uh, that continues even after the patient is no longer with us. So as an employee, we know you can be exposed, but just make sure that you are responsible. Hopefully your employers have gotten you to sign a confidentiality agreement. And again, how you came into possession of such information that you don't release that, you don't do something silly with that and release things that you shouldn't. So confidential information should not be discussed with anybody except on a professional need to know basis. Um, and that's so true. So again, I think just common sense type of thing. So I find it very interesting that in lots of hospitals, some of your bigger facilities, again, they're very serious about this. They go in, they monitor as they should. Um, I've seen us lose some amazing people because of silly small things. It's interesting how you can go onto the OIG website and look at some of the actions and some of the things that have led to suspension, things that have led to Shining Star, managing nurses, people that just do silly things and sometimes we don't think and they lose their job and there's huge ramifications as a result of that. Um, even in the building in which I work, um, we have sort of a small rule area, if you will, but we uh, take the trash out. And one day one of my girls discovered some trash out there with patient records in it from the office upstairs. We have a couple different buildings that lease space, excuse me, a couple different practices that lease space in this building. And there was some information discarded in the trash that had tons of patient, patient uh, Social security numbers, birthdays, addresses, again, anything. And I'm like, wow. And they just made a mistake that day and put it in their trash bin. Uh, that you can imagine how, how upset we were when we saw that. But again, it's, it's a huge risk management issue. Um, you've got to take it very seriously. It's nothing to be taken lightly. So anytime there is a confidential patient, um, if there's something going on, make sure you report that to your practice manager, your compliance manager, and make sure that you rectify that as soon as possible. Computer systems, again, I've seen the internet get folks into trouble. Uh, probably got me into some troubles today because I couldn't get on my webinar, so again, I apologize. But you only access information needed to perform your specific job. You never access patient information on a patient that you are not directly involved with just because you're curious doesn't really count. And then you never share passwords. Um, I've gone in and done some auditing and consulting and I just slide the keyboard tray over and there's their password and stuff. So be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful with that. So never leave your area exposed. Never leave patient information up. Um, again, and don't access information unless, again, it pertains to you. You can overhear things sometimes, even from friends, relatives, family members. Uh, again, if you see a chart laying around or something that should have been closed out and it's not, just make sure you do your due diligence and keep that secure as possible. If a coworker is asking you for information, you certainly have the right to ask them, what do you intend on doing with this information? Why do you need it? What are you going to do with it? Is it going to be relevant to your job? You can certainly ask. That's OK. And then some guidelines, some things that you can use in response. You can say, I'm sorry, I cannot release that information. I'm not allowed to provide that confidential information to you. I have been asked by the patient not to release that information. And again, do you have a need for it? What are you going to do with it? So again, uh, talk to your supervisor, talk to your compliance person or the appropriate level person if you are ever put in that situation. And if somebody starts to tell you kind of the same thing, if you flip that over, you can certainly respond back. I really don't need to know that. Um, how did you find that out? That's probably confidential. And again, I think we just need to end the conversation here. So you be as smart as you possibly can with that. Because sometimes you get information from outside sources. You're going to get all kinds of things, especially if you work in a specialty type of facility or a specialty type of practice. In other words, like gastroenterology, they're referral-based. So most of their patients come from other sources. 
So in those situations, again, passing on information is a violation. Uh, it's very serious. There are civil penalties that can be imposed, criminal penalties, so lots of things that could happen. I've also included as an additional handout for you a uh, fax, a medical records fax transmission authorization because what happens if you fax information to the wrong office? Maybe the person on the other end gave you the wrong number that they are dyslexic. So again, you could add that to your resources, add that to your arsenal, um, so you can kind of take a peek at that as well. And again, you're free to uh, pleasurize, use that at your discretion. So know who to direct your HIPAA concerns to. Again, that would be a compliance person, office manager, security officer, could be one and the same. Evaluate your computer systems that you have now. Uh, look to see how you dispose of protected health information or identifiable information. Again, making sure that you are storing them properly. If you have emerging systems, so to say, determine what entities that you're going to share information with inside and outside of the office. So this is a nice little checklist for you. So I'll just point out some of the ones that I think are relevant. You can go back and look at these when you get a moment. But uh, like for the third one here, it says follow safeguards again. We have administrative, we have technical, and we have physical levels of information, like our passwords. How often do you change your password? Where do you keep your password? Your logins for maybe some of these insurance payers and such, even getting into your system. You may have a dual system, one for coding, one for billing, one for checking in. I don't know. I don't know your system parameters, but make sure you safeguard. So know whom. Uh, information can be released to, and again, how you protect that. How you have electronic versus hard copy as well, looking at your fax machines, uh, electronic storage devices, all of the above. Again, some other ones, looking at how you destroy that information, how is it exposed if it's left out on your desk. You know, sometimes it might be as simple as turning a piece of paper over. As I said earlier, I like sign-in sheets. Those are great for my front desk team. But you don't want to have a field on there that says, why are you here to see the doctor today? Well, if you're in an ob -gen practice and young lady signs in and she says, possible pregnancy, and then you have Miss Nosy Body sitting in your lobby and she says, oh, isn't that so-and-so's daughter? And oh, she thinks she could be pregnant? Oh, my goodness. And people are nosy. It's just, it's, that's just human nature. So just safeguard as best you can. I do like sign-in sheets, too, for another reason, that you could add a little box to the far right that says, how will you be paying your portion of the bill today? Cash, check, credit card. So if they have a copay or they have co-insurance or something that you're going to be collecting from them today, if they leave that blank and they don't mark that, let that be a clue for your front desk team. So again, you want to start the effort now, especially as ICD-10 being upon us, you want to make sure that everybody kind of understands the issues involved in privacy and taking care of that information, how we protect it to the best of our ability. Because it's huge. Healthcare is changing so rapidly. Um, another one here on the checklist is that you want to make sure that you're not releasing information over an intercom. Maybe you meant to hit somebody's personal button to ring their desk and you're blasting stuff through the office and you might not even know. Make sure that conversations are kind of kept in a confidential tone. Maybe lower your voice. Uh, architecture being what it is, we have very open treatment areas these days. Again, but you just use your common sense. Um, certainly we might have patients that are hard of hearing. For those patients, pull them to the side if you need to talk to them. Um, if you have nurses that are calling in things over the phone, Pull the nurse to the side. Let her do that from maybe a more nice, secure little location. Not that she has to hang out in the closet all day, but you kind of get my point. Always wear appropriate identification in your office. That lets folks know who you are. Um, and we already kind of said, don't share your password. Keep your password secure. Um, never, ever allow somebody to use theirs if they say, oh, I forgot mine. And it'd be just log out because, again, you may be liable for somebody else's work. And that might not be so hot. So you want to review, revise, initiate some of your authorization forms, especially if you haven't done that as of late with some of the omnibus revisions that I mentioned. 
initiate that patient notice of information. Again, that use and disclosure form, take a peek at that and know what your, pol your policies are. Even in your practice, you might have a small solo group as opposed to a bigger facility. And again, lots of stuff. Make sure that all of your staff is well trained, that they understand the confidentiality statement and what that means, as well as your mission statement in your practice, and know what your reporting systems are for violations. As such, what happened, who was involved, how can we prevent this from happening in the future. And looking at your business associate agreements as well. I actually have my drug reps sign them, especially if they're coming in and hanging out with us for a while, maybe bringing some goodies by or whatever. You want to make sure that they too, if they're passing a patient in the hallway or whatever, that information is safeguarded. Some other ones, uh, they are participate in a level of progressive discipline. So in other words, what happens if I do violate? Am I just going to get a nice little slap on the hand? Or could you ultimately retrain that person? Certainly you want to save and salvage your staff as opposed to scrapping them. Uh, it just depends on what the violation is. And make sure that your computers, again, have nice virus protection on them. Some other ones worth mentioning at the end of the day, make sure your computers are logged off, that your records are secure for sure. Uh, again, anything that is a password, a login type of thing, make sure that you don't share that. Um, and then have a backup plan. What happens if your computers go down? What if you can't get into your system, um, especially in the case of a fire or some type of disaster recovery? What happens if you can't get that stuff? So you want to stand, as I mentioned earlier, common sense type of thing. Stand where your patients stand, um, maybe even where they walk in the hallway. Do you see anything that could potentially be a violation, something that could put me at a higher risk, like a computer or on a shelf or on the wall or on my desk? So some people, you know, are very savvy and they can read upside down, sideways, uh, crazy stuff. Uh, so you don't know what their talents might be. So be mindful of those folks. And then again, encryption, get with your IT folks. Um, as we said, our doctors now, our physicians, our clinicians, our nurses, they're using those mobile devices. Be careful um, because AT&T might tell you that it's secure, but it might not be. So make sure that you have policy procedure on that, on your cell phones, even for your patients, which your patients may not like that now. Uh, but those personal devices can certainly get you into some trouble. I've put a ton of resource information on here for you of where you can get information. Um, so there's tons of, you don't have to spend a whole lot of money to get information at your fingertips. You can probably get a lot of that uh, even on a sidebar without spending a lot of money. And a lot, uh, you know, there's tons of information out there for you. And you can certainly contact me. And I didn't on this particular slide give you my email, but I will. So if you want me to give you that now, we can certainly give this back over to Jill if she has any questions or concerns. But my email is pretty easy. It's actually my name. Um, as we said, it's probably an identifier, right? But it's Rhonda, it's R-H-O-N-D-A, at rhondagranja.com. And that's spelled G-R-A-N-J-A. So it's my first name at my first and last name dot com. And uh, hopefully this has been short, sweet, to the point, but I'll be glad to take some questions, Jill, or uh, if you want to email me those or however you want to handle that. Thank you, Rhonda. If you have any questions, please use, please use Rhonda's contact information on the screen. Our next webinar titled, I'm Being Harassed, What to Do When Your Employee Claims Harassment is scheduled for July 21st with Scott Holt, attorney from Young, Conaway, Stargat, and Taylor. Registration will be available shortly on our website, 1sthcc.com. Please feel free to contact us for a demo of our compliance solution at 888-543-4778 or email us at info at 1sthcc.com.